Thank you so much, Claudio. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellow travelers, we are indeed very excited to have Bernard Coman with us here uh, today. And uh, the context for this conversation is the 14 Rooms exhibition, which Klaus Wiesenbach and I curated. I'm going to give you a short introduction to the exhibition. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, and you will then understand from the curatorial premise of the show how this connects very directly to the books of, of Bernard. We met many times with Bernard before uh, in the context, of course, of a dialogue between art and literature, which I think is so important, and which here, in the context of our Basel conversations, we've explored for many, many years. Uh, I remember, for example, with Alain Rob Grier, and that's actually our big connection, because we met through Alain Rob Grier. Um, we uh, celebrated Robert Rauschenberg. It was an homage in Miami. Robert Rauschenberg was then still alive. Uh, and we invited uh, the late Alain Rob Grier to um, pay tribute you know, to uh, the incredible work of Robert Rauschenberg and honor him. Uh, and they collaborated on books. It's a wonderful bridge between art and literature. They did artist books together. Uh, and it's more or less at that time, you know, traveling with Alain Rob Grier to Miami and uh, spending time with him there, learning from him about his amazing visionary you know, novels, that um, I came across the work of Bernard because he did the most sensational interview with Alain Rob Grier. For those of you who haven't read it, it's an absolute must. Uh, it was radio conversations, which then were made into a book, and uh, actually were so extraordinary that the artist Bertrand Lavier once said to Rob Grier uh, that it's not even necessary anymore to read his novels, because if one listens to these radio conversations, one doesn't have to read the books anymore. I wasn't sure if Alain Rob Grier agreed completely, but it was a great you know, compliment to the amazing quality of these uh, interviews. Now, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14 rooms, which Klaus Wiesenbach and I curated here for the Bayer Foundation, are part and the Theatre Basel, it's a collaboration between the three institutions, does have a lot to do, of course, with live art. The rule of the game is, as you know, we have these you know, 14 plus 1 doors. Behind them, we have living sculptures. The sculptures are there. It's a quite classical sculpture galleries from 10 in the morning to 7 at night. And then, and that's the difference to objects, then at 7 o'clock at night, the sculptures go home. And the space is empty, you know, and the next morning, they uh, come again. It's an exhibition which continues to grow, so we add a room you know, every year. So next year it will be uh, 15 rooms. It's always going to another city. It's a bit like the house of the, the mystery house of the Winchester Widow, you know, a house which keeps growing. Uh, and here we have the architecture of Herzog de Meran, who basically uh, developed an amazing, again, inspired by literature by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, these mirroring walls which mirror the 14 rooms into uh, infinity. We also have here, uh, for the first time, technology in the exhibition of the 14 rooms. We added last minute the 15th room, which is the animatronic robot of Jordan Wolfson, where the living sculpture is actually a robot, which you look at into the mirror, and then it looks at you. Uh, and at the same time, also with Ed Atkins, a new work, which is about an avatar. Um, and uh, for those of you who you know, will be in London soon, we all hope you can visit the exhibition of Ed Atkins at the Serpentine Galleries, uh, actually at the Serpentine Sackler Gallery, which is an exhibition where Ed Atkins works even more you know, in a Gesamtkunstwerk kind of way on this idea of the avatar. Now, the exhibition is a ritual, and it's a, you know, one of the uh, uh, kind of key modern rituals because uh, of the modern era because you have usually a crowd of people which is addressed you know, in theater or in, in a concert or in opera by one or a few speakers or singers who then address the crowd. And I think what the exhibition introduced, and there is a very beautiful text by the scholar Dorothea von Handelmann on this, um, is actually that it's a, a crowd of people not addressed as a crowd, but as a number of individuals. And that's what the medium of the exhibition has done you know, throughout the modern era. And that's still a very, very valid point, you know, why we love exhibitions. And I think also why more and more people go to the exhibitions in the age of the internet, you know, even more so, because you can make experiences you could never make, you know, alone in front of a screen. Now, there are, however, limits to this idea of the exhibition. And Dorothea von Handelmann reminds us of Margaret Mead, and that brings us then already closely to the books of Bernal, uh, the anthropologist Margaret Mead, who in her uh, critique of the exhibition actually criticizes that the exhibition does not address all the senses. 
She says that actually, you know, medieval masses or Bali rituals uh, address many more senses than an exhibition which is only focusing on the visual primacy, which, you know, most art exhibitions do. Um, she also, Margaret Mead, mentions that there actually is a lack, a structural problem of exhibitions that it doesn't tie, you see, so that it doesn't really create ties or connections. So the question really is, and that's the key question we can, you know, somehow uh, conclude from Dorothea von Handelmann's art historical treatise on the exhibition as a, as a ritual, which she presented last week at the opening of the Venice Biennale in our Swiss, you know, architectural uh, pavilion uh, in her series of vignettes. But we can also conclude it from the anthropologist, uh, you know, Margaret Mead. The question how to create a ritual that actually creates ties, that creates connections, human connections, but which still remains democratic and liberal, you know, which is this free ritual the exhibition is, where you basically ag address the crowd as individuals. And that sort of more individualized sort of hybrid space connects it very much to these two amazing book, you know, Bernard have, has written. Uh, and it was actually in Paris in a, a conversation where I told Bernard about this exhibition uh, fought in rooms, and he was telling me that it appears in both of his books, in the Triptych de l'Angle, and of course, above all, in the Colloque de Buste, which is all about living sculpture. So we are very, very excited to have Bernard here. And Bernard, if you could maybe tell us about these two books and how living sculptures appear there, that would be great. Thank you, um, Hans Ulrich. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, Indeed, uh, the case made that when we last time met in Paris, uh, we had this conversation. And uh, chrono chronologically, uh, the first text I wrote was uh, uh, about... Um, uh, the nails? nails, was about nails. And where, where have come ideas from, I don't know exactly. It was very hot in uh, summer in Rome. Uh, it, it was some boring day in Rome, and uh, suddenly I had the idea of an art installation. Uh, the artist gets 10 disoccupied people, puts them on stage, uh, without shoes, takes for the opening a hammer and knocks on uh, the fingers of the disoccupied people. And the show lasts up to the last black nail falls. Uh, it was a very strange idea. Uh, I don't know why, probably because there is a, a French expression uh, which says corps social, uh, which would mean uh, social body. And I was very interested in the treatment, uh, nearly a medical treatment, the social body uh, brings to the disoccupied people. And I was very interested and shocked by the violence, the prog progressive violence of this treatment. Uh, I mean, the people who don't work are considered as outside people, more and more outside people. So I wanted to interrogate uh, this situation uh, of, of these people through the point of view of an artistic inter intervention. Uh, this artistic uh, piece would take place not here in Basel, but could have. Uh, but it's uh, in uh, the Villa Medici in Roma. And then, a few years after, I had another idea, uh, probably because uh, I saw two movies. Uh, the first is Johnny Got His Gun, uh, the story of, uh, of a soldier who comes, who comes back, who is considered half deaf, but he hears everything around him. Uh, but he can't speak, he can't move, and the other movie was Freaks of Ted Browning. So I imagined that in the uh, future, which could be uh, present, uh, 
some people would like to bring in their collection human bodies, but without legs and without arms. And this, is, uh, this would be the new brand uh, of modernity to have one of these pieces uh, in, in its collection. Uh, my, my question was, at what point can you live without something? Uh, what is the minimal uh, for uh, being alive? Uh, and uh, I made uh, research and uh, I dis discovered that you can live without arms and legs. So, but you, you can't move, you can't do anything, you don't have any autom uh, autonomy. Uh, so you can be put on, uh, on the cheminée or uh, in, uh, in the angle of a, of a room like a piece of art, but a living piece of art. And uh, of course, the economy is always interested in everything. And for the launchment of a new uh, logiciel, uh, a software, of a new software um, which helps to um, transfer the speaking in writing. The director of the software has the idea to make a meeting with these uh, human bodies who can't, of course, write and to make a show for the demonstration of the software because they speak and on the screen what they say appears written. And it's the theme of uh, this other piece uh, called Le Colloque des Bustes. Uh, let's say uh, the conversation of uh, Bust. To stay a little bit with this triptych, uh, Le Triptych de l'Angle, there is a postface by Tabuki, and I think Tabuki, uh, one of the greatest you know, writers of our time, is, is, uh, uh, is, is a, a writer you've been very close to, you've translated him, and uh, is a friend of yours. Maybe it's interesting that you tell us a little bit about Tabuki, because he has a very interesting theory on your triptych, on your living sculpture triptych. He says it's kind of like, he connects it to Lego somehow, he says it's a kind of a Lego is a Lego principle. Can you tell us about uh, Tabuki, about what connects you to Tabuki and what he wrote here? Uh, I, lo I, I really like his, uh, his uh, foreword. It's not a foreword, it's after the book, post fast, yeah. because I absolutely don't agree with him. And uh, uh, he, makes, he makes a reading of, uh, 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 of my text, uh, which is really far from what I wanted to do. And, I thought it was really excellent to have this other point of view on the book at the end. And uh, the triptych is made of three stories around the same, uh, the same event, which would be uh, the exhibition of these ten people um, with the hammer uh, knocked on uh, the fingers. And uh, one is from the po point of view of uh, the director of a cultural institution, which would be Villa Medici in Roma. Uh, the other one is the point of view of the artist. And the third one is the point of view of one of the disoccupied people. And it, uh, it, it's in uh, New York, in the new museum in New York. Obviously, it's interesting, you know, with live art is also the question of, uh, of memory, you know, the question how it's archived and what, you know, produces memory, and that will lead us also to, to the films, you know, uh, the film, the Arte film, which is being made on 14 rooms, in, where you have been very instrumental in, you know, in making that happen. The film, uh, Heinz-Peter Schwerfel, has been shooting here in Basel non-stop over the last couple of days, you know, in the exhibition, in every of the spaces. Um, and it would be interesting to talk a little bit about this aspect of memory, because, um, I mean, Rem Kola says that maybe, I mean, we have more and more information, but maybe actually 
uh, amnesia is kind of at the core of our digital age. And you've written a lot on memory and have actually described the process of writing as paying an ontological debt. And I was kind of curious how you conceptualize writing as a sort of a cycle of memory, because you described the memory past, actually, in the shadow of memory, you described the, the cycle, uh, or the, you know, the, the kind of memory past from the two protagonists as a kind of inheritance. And I was sort of wondering if you can tell us a little bit also, you know, in relation to 14 rooms, uh, can one sort of conceptualize actually those who have sort of exceptional human memories and, you know, what is memory in the digital age? I think we, we live in a time um, in a conflict. Uh, from one part, uh, there is uh, an exaltation of present, uh, of uh, immediate things. And on the other part, uh, there is a fetishism of memory, of archives. And this is the di dialectic between uh, both of them, which is uh, very interesting. And, uh, it's exactly what I did in this first novel called uh, The Shadow of Memory. Uh, it's uh, an old man who knows everything uh, by heart, uh, every text, every picture. Uh, uh, it's very built on uh, uh, Italian, picture, uh, Italian uh, Renaissance. And he knows everything. And there is a young guy fascinated by his, his memory, but he, he doesn't want to spend the, 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 the time for acquiring all this memory. And he has the idea that he could have it in inheritance. Uh, and there is a, a kind of contract between, between them. Um, and it's the story of, uh, of the novel. And, you know, in, in, in the television, sometimes you have very strange meetings because they are just looking for ideas. Money is here, and you have to use it, uh, but ideas are not here. And uh, we had a lunch in Arte, and uh, I was interested. I, um, I consider that since many years, uh, there is an art ephemer, uh, which is very important. And this art ephemer disappears after the event. So there is a contradiction, of course, in archiving what is created for disappear after the event. But this contradiction was very exciting, exciting and I immediately had the idea to propose uh, to Hans Ulrich Obrist uh, to build this series. Uh, now we have done one film, but I hope we'll make 50 or 100 films uh, on this ID. Because when there is one good ID in a television, you have to go on. Now that's indeed very exciting because obviously there is an amnesia, you know, of exhibition history and very often, you know, and this idea that, which was your, your wonderful idea, uh, uh, actually together with Chano uh, to, to, to develop, you know, a series actually of, of, uh, uh, of documentaries or films about the making of uh, exhibitions and also then about, you know, the actual exhibition and also maybe the afterlife of the exhibition about the scars and how exhibition travels through time is something which just in the world of exhibition has never really existed and obviously at the moment when more and more the medium of the exhibition is so important actually for artists to do time-based work becomes you know, very urgent. It would be interesting to maybe, if you can tell us a little bit more about the previous you know, series you've been doing and leading in Arte about that, because you've been doing it for literature in a very consequent way for a long time, and you've been doing it also for, um, uh, you've been doing it also for architecture, Luciano, uh, and you with actually this idea of buildings and the memory of buildings. Uh, can you tell us about these previous series which precede this you know, series on Arte now about exhibitions? Uh, yes, um, the idea was uh, that uh, we have a crisis uh, in, uh, and mostly in Europe and uh, we need to understand what Europe is, uh, mostly the Europe of culture and uh, my idea was that uh, nobody better than writers could show us and let us think about what is 
Europe and in, at which point we are European people, but also Italian people or Spanish people. I mean, when you speak of a writer, you always say, uh, this is a great Spanish writer or Portuguese writer. But what does it mean, Spanish writer? What, what is there in this word Spanish? And probably it's a lot of records, uh, um, experiences uh, in the past uh, of uh, memory, of uh, collective memory. Uh, and we asked to some writers not to speak about their books uh, uh, in a promotional uh, way of speaking, but to speak about their originary country. Uh, and to explain us what is, for example, Spain in the mind of a Spanish writer? What events determine the idea of Spain? And what uh, I had a conversation many, many years ago with uh, Enrique Villamatas, and we had the same idea that the fundamental experience one can make is the way from home to school when you are a child. You know every moment of this way. And it remains in your mind as a fundamental luggage. You go through life always with this valise fundamentale. And this was the idea to ask to some writers to open the luggage and to tell us what there is in this luggage as records, as sensations. And of course, in the luggage, there is also the collective uh, history. And uh, for each country, we had two or three writers for trying to understand what would be the DNA of these countries. It was, a, it was an answer to the administrative conception of countries, and sometimes exclusive conception of countries. And we believed, and uh, I guess we were right, that writers could give us another conception of territory and of memory. And it's obviously interesting because it's quite similar, you know, with your art series of, of, of films. You know, it's, an, uh, it's analog to exhibition making that once with exhibition making, one has defined the rule of the game. And to find that rule of the game is incredibly difficult. It took Klaus and me, you know, years and years of thinking and discussing, speaking every day almost about finding this very simple rule of 11 rooms and one room every year and all of that. But once it's set, it can then go on forever. You know, we can have in 2050, 50 rooms. It can even continue with other people later. So we could have in 2,100, 100 rooms and all of that. And in a similar way, I mean, these Arte films, there are dozens and dozens in this series you did with literature. But then there is also this incredible invention with architecture, which was so successful and is so successful. And the other rule of the game is actually, in an interesting way, you know, the 11, 12, 13, 14 rooms are obviously lead towards a house, and that's all about buildings, right? The architecture thing. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, architecture is uh, most of the time one place and one architect. And uh, to explain all the story of this uh, building, this construction, uh, the problems uh, of materials uh, there was, and uh, it's, uh, it's of course uh, uh, an, an open series uh, which could never end. And it's very important to have open series like that in television because, uh, unfortunately, nowadays, television is very connected to program. You can't make a movie if you don't have already the program for uh, next year or in two years. Uh, and I consider that the intelligent and creative television shouldn't be connected to program but should produce archives, and archives and archives. And in 10 years or in 50 years, you'll have these archives 
with another perception, and you, you, you'll, you'll use them in a different way than today. And it's the, it's the main stream we have to impone, and we have to fight against the program. And uh, this is the best way, probably, to fight, because when you begin a series, you can make 50 or 100 uh, films, and it's very important, because uh, they are not determined by program. They, 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 they are uh, a land in themselves, and they are the archives of tomorrow. And it's very, I, I, I think uh, it's very important now to produce archives. I'm, I'm working now uh, on, uh, on a new novel, and on the idea that for the first time, our archives for tomorrow will be connected to the necessity of an energy, electricity. It's the first time. It's a, a, an anthropological change. Uh, and if there is no more electricity, this is the subject of the next uh, novel. And, uh, and we have a digital... I mean, uh, Daniel Healy says, then we will have a digital black hole. And it's kind of interesting because you said that with the rise of the internet, I found an interview here where you said the access to the memory of humanity is conditioned by having electricity. And that obviously uh, raises also the issue, on the one hand, could it all disappear in a digital black hole or in a non-electrical post-electrical black hole? And then also it raises another issue I wanted to ask you about, which is I wanted to ask you if you feel that the inherent qualities of human memory have or are being actually altered by the access to technological memory. That, you know, the access to technological memory changes our memory. It's a big risk. I mean, uh, I don't know very, whether it changes, because it's no really easier to, to treat uh, all archives. Uh, even if, uh, for example, you, you, you won't have the same archives on, on, uh, on, uh, on um, actual writers than you had on Flaubert, for example, uh, with all the ver versions of the same text. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that, in the same time, you had the trend of uh, the, the present, the triumph from, of present, and you have uh, the development of uh, genetical, critic, genetical critics and all the, the interest for uh, all the versions of, uh, of writers. And probably it's, it's a sign of an... Um, Anguas, anxiety we have in front of, uh, of memory and uh, archives. We have an incredible possibility to, to produce digital archive, but are we so sure that this archive will, will last? Uh, probably not. Yeah, we did with Bettina correct this conversation with Daniel Hillis, and he's one of the inventors of uh, you know the supercomputers which allowed the Google age and you know the digital kind of engines to to work and he predicts a digital dark age so that's kind of fascinating. The question is obviously also what are we you know losing, what are we gaining you know through this digital memory, what are we losing because I think there are positive and negative sides. And one of the things which is interesting is that obviously handwriting um, uh, is about to uh, to, to disappear, and that letter writing, you know, is, is about to disappear. And that's, I mean, prompted me to do my Instagram project where I post handwritten sentences every day to kind of, you know, celebrate handwriting. But it's also, I mean, the other day I, you know, wrote the obituary for Maria Lasnik, the great Austrian painter who died age 94 uh, a few weeks ago, actually on my, May 8th. And, and um, uh, you know, we somehow um, went to a funeral, you know, in, in Vienna with Julia Peyton Johns and, and, you know, thought a lot about her memory. And then, all of a sudden, I, I actually went back to all the letters she had written me, to me in the 80s, in the 90s, when I was a student. I got all these letters, you know, from her about photography and why, why painting, you know, can go to places photography can't go and all of that. And I was suddenly thinking, you know, with artists of my own generation, you know, that just wouldn't be that kind of letter exchange. Then, you know, with an artist of that generation, I suppose the same in literature. You have this incredible tradition of entire books having been, you know, that the, form, the format of the epistolary exchange as a book is at the risk of disappearing. And you've done an amazing project, actually, 
uh, about Marilyn Monroe and uh, uh, you know the letters of Marilyn Monroe, these uh, long time kind of lost letters, which uh, um, and that's another thing we met through that as well when Stanley Buchthal, you know, produced a movie uh, connected to these letters. And you've you've described the writings of Marilyn these letters as endlessly giving of herself. So it's a bit a long question, but I was curious if you could tell a little bit about the art of letter writing, the protest against the disappearance of that, Marilyn's last letter, and what you did there. Uh, this book, Fragments, uh, is a very important uh, literary book uh, for me. Um, when I discovered this text of Marilyn Monroe, uh, I discovered them uh, nearly 50 years after her death, and uh, I, I, I couldn't believe what I read. Uh, it was very strange because normally you find these things five or ten years after the death of somebody. Uh, Fifty years was really improbable. And when I w when I went to New York for uh, for having the first discussion with uh, Anna Strasberg, um, I I didn't have a good feeling uh, because I thought it would be casual texts gossip, things like that. And it was absolutely the opposite. Uh, probably it's the only book made of this stuff. Uh, normally, uh, an actress, a star, writes memoir uh, at the end of her life, uh, or makes somebody write memoir, and this is a reconstruction of a life. In this case, Marilyn wrote directly, immediately, what she had in mind, without addressing this to anybody, without building this in a formal way. Uh, Sometimes it's like poems, but it's not a real poetic way. Uh, sometimes it's like the beginning of a letter, but it's very sporadic. She never ends something. It's just in a moment she needs to put it down, to put on the paper what she feels, and what she has in mind. And this is like the recording of a soul, of a mind. And it's really, really uh, an enormous thing for me. Uh, because you have the impression to, to live this with her. And uh, I was very impressed by the quality of this text. It was sometimes really difficult to, to read her writing. And we protected these writings. Because uh, what is very curious then is that Anna Strasberg asked a European editor to make the job. Uh, by the way, American. Uh, publishers were not so happy of this. But I think she had a perfect intuition, because probably an American publisher would have insert this text, for example, in a, in a story of Marion, and putting letters, poems, and other things in a story, thinking it would be more uh, commercial. We decided the opposite. We decided to treat Marilyn's fragments as we would have treated Rambo's fragments. And we did it in a very literary way with facsimile of the, te of the original text and the transcription. And we have put her in the position of the author of a book she never wrote and uh, read it. It is indeed an urgent book. It's also, of course, 
a book which is connected to a film, uh, and that leads us to uh, a last thing I wanted to ask you because we talked about you know many different aspects of uh, um, of your of your practice, and you know I think uh, in we started out with this idea of the direct connection, you know, to the uh, the 14 rooms, you know, with these books about living sculptures you wrote and exhibitions as a as a ritual, and and uh, uh, and it's really very interesting to almost like have a parallel reading of Dorothea von Handelmann's book as an art historical treatise, you know, on the exhibition of the ritual, uh, and then you writing fiction, you know, on that. Uh, then we talked about you know your your curatorial work, your work in television. I mean, that idea of the series outside the program is very interesting because that's also what a touring show is. I mean, 14 Rooms is nothing else than that. It's a series of exhibitions which has its own life now and exists outside any program. It just, you know, in this sense, continues to evolve. So there's an interesting parallel there. We've then talked about, you know, the about Marilyn and that somehow brings us to a last aspect of your work we haven't discussed, the connection to cinema. Because you've also uh, got another extraordinary collaboration, similarly to Alain Rob Grier, which is with Alain Tanner, one of the greatest uh, Swiss filmmakers of all times. And uh, you uh, co-wrote the screenplays for many of his legendary films. I think Furby was uh, the 96 one, then Requiem 98, Jonas Elila Till Tomorrow 99, and then Paul Sanvain 2004. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Tanner and, and, and how that collaboration works and the sort of whole aspect of screenplays in, in your work, how you connect literature to, to, to cinema? Uh, Alain Tanner had read uh, two or three of my books uh, when, I met, uh, when I first met him, and uh, he told me he would, love to, he would have liked to, to uh, adapt one of these books. And I told him, uh, I'm absolutely not interested in working on this, uh, because I did the book, make the film, but I don't want to be here to protect my ideas or my f characters or, 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 or my book. And finally, he decided to make an original film. He, he told me, he called me one day, and he told me, would you like to write my next film with me? And I said, but I, I never did it. Uh, I, 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 I don't know how to do this. And he, asked, and he, answer, he answered, uh, that's exactly why I want to work with you. Because you don't know how to do this. And it was a very good way to begin uh, a collaboration. And uh, indeed, uh, I, I wrote the film as I would have uh, written a book. And then uh, he told me that he would write the dialogues, because dialogues were the voice of actors, and I wouldn't be on stage for working with actors. So it, it was his part. He, he wrote the dialogues, and then we worked together on the dialogues, but uh, it was, a, it was a really a very pleasant way because uh, he didn't want to reduce me to what I wasn't. He just wanted to use me for what I was, and it was really pleasant. A very last question, Bernard, is about, you know, to come back to the beginning, we started with Alain Rob Grier, and I think we should end uh, with Alain Rob Grier. I learned a lot from uh, the great Alain Rob Grier. You know, he basically didn't want to do any lectures anymore in France because he felt that he always would only lecture in France. And he said he would agree to do any project I wanted to invite him to do as long as it was outside France. So I've set up in the 90s a whole series of journeys with him, and we went to Iceland. And you know, I almost became a literature mentor. And we went actually to Iceland, where a legendary happening happened, where in an school, old schoolhouse in uh, Adar, in an Icelandic village, we screamed Marienbad and had you know Matthew Barney and Isaac Julian and Doug Aitken and many artists discuss with him you know, that, that amazing film. But I mean, the most important thing I learned from Rob Grier is actually utterly pragmatic, because he said you know, no one anymore really would give a writer the time you know, uh, no publisher will kind of give the right at the time to work 20 years on a novel. And that's also true for a curator. There just isn't uh, a place in the world where a curator could 
have a research for 10 or 20 years to work on a show. So Rob Greer said we need new tricks. And uh, it was quite instrumental, this conversation, for me to come up with this idea, which, you know, what Klaus and I do now with 11 rooms and what we've done many times before. I've done it with Do It and all kinds of exhibitions, where one actually develops a traveling show as an endless kind of loop. And because it continues to travel, you can then suddenly research uh, uh, for years and years because you know it happens every year. And the research, once you know, we've now been researching for four years on this exhibition. A year before 11, it started, and then 11, 12, 13, 14, and and that gives that sort of research horizon otherwise no longer possible. And Rob Grier said for literature is the same. That's why he each time actually, um, whenever there was the possibility to write the text considered that to be the possibility to write another chapter. And at the end, he had his novel, because no one you know, would give him 10 years to write the novel. But he'd each year write the chapter or use the context to write the chapter. That was very pragmatic advice, given you know, the amazing, and I really urge you all to get that book of Bernard's interview with Rob Grier. It's one of my favorite books ever, interview books ever. And uh, I was sort of curious, given all these conversations you did with Alain Rob Grier, what you took away from it? What, what did you learn from? Alain Rob Grier, for your own work? Oh, I guess I learned everything from him. He was very important. Uh, and his books are among the first books of literature I read. And uh, I was really f fascinated by, uh, by his way. For example, um, he uses the plantation of bananas. And you know, the bananas are uh, crowing um, in a very disordered way. Uh, you can't, um, th because they, they grow from, from the, uh, by the side. And it, it's, it produces disorder. And the vision of the bananas is the vision of what happens in his book, uh, La Jalousie, for example. And he had really this capacity to make to put everything making sense together. Uh, the other thing I really liked in him is that he never insisted in the same place and the same way. He renewed his writing uh, on every book. And sometimes the, the, the critics were very disappointed because uh, they expected a new Rob Grier. But in fact, they expected the same Rob Grier. And they had a very, very new Rob Grier, and they were uh, sometimes very astonished. And I, I really like this way. Uh, and he was very curious in music, in painting. Uh, he made a splendid collaboration uh, with um, Rosenberg and with other, other painters. And when we make these interviews, it was really beautiful because he arrived at the Maison de la Radio uh, in Paris, in a studio. Uh, and the first time, he thought it wouldn't be good. So he came for making a test. And it was really very excited. We, we make three transmissions, uh, one after the other. Uh, the complete program would have been of 25 uh, uh, transmissions. And every time he came, he wanted to take the same coffee and the same lemon uh, tartelette, because he thought uh, it brought uh, luck to the, to the program we did. And he absolutely wanted to take them in the same place. And a ritual. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was planned, and I was very happy. I did it also with uh, Daniel Arras uh, about the story, uh, story of art. And uh, it, this is a, a luxury of the, ra uh, the, the radio. You, you can make uh, 20 hours with somebody, and uh, you spend very very few, very nothing. I mean, and it's really perfect archive. And uh, I'm really happy to sometimes to hear uh, Rob Grier. And 
it was at the end of, uh, nearly at the end of uh, his life, and uh, it was the post phase to, to his life and work. There could not be a better conclusion, and also actually uh, a very funny coincidence is that in today's uh, daily, you know, art newspaper is announced that there is seemingly a re-edition of all the DVDs of, of Rob Grier's movies coming out soon, and that's obviously another great connection between the two of you, the connection between literature and cinema. Bernard, thank you very, very much, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.